is another episode of Global Sports Channel's Sports Personality Spotlight, and I'm your host for today, Tasha Danvers, two-time Olympian and Olympic bronze medalist. And I have a wonderful guest for you today. He is a legend in his industry. He won both Australian championships in 1981 and 1982. He has defeated tennis giants like Andre Agassi, Jimmy Connors, John McEnroe, the list goes on. He's won 14 professional singles and eight doubles titles. Please welcome into the studio, as we say, Johan Creek. Welcome, Johan. How are you today? Thank you. I'm doing great, Nastasha. Thank you very much for the invite. Uh, it's great to uh, speak with you. Absolutely. It's an honor. So we were chit-chatting before the show and you said you were boating today. You, you're, a, you're a boating fan, I see. Tell me about that. Well, you know, that's kind of the, the sport du jour now. It seems it's racket sports and boating. That's about the only sports we can do nowadays with COVID. Uh, right. So, uh, Right. So, uh, you know, I talked to some boating uh, dealers here in Florida and they're out of inventory. Everybody's bought all the boats. So there's no more wow. boats for sale. I mean, there's no new boats anymore. So, wow. uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, we, we're a boating family. We love to go in the water and uh, this part of Florida is just beautiful. Yes, I actually used to live in Florida way back in the 80s when I was teeny weeny in West Palm Beach. Where where are you guys located? You write on the shore yeah, there? We just north, yeah, we're just north of Palm Beach. In fact, we're here in Palm Beach Gardens. Nice, nice. So have, is boating something that you've been, you've been interested in? Have you had a boat for a long time or is this new since the whole COVID situation has been happening? Yeah, I'm so old that I actually, uh, I was one of the founders of the, the canoe. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, uh, I lived on the west coast of Florida. I lived in Naples, Florida for uh, 37 odd years and uh, boating was part of my uh, my relaxation when I was on a, on a tour and uh, tennis and all that has been, uh, you know, my whole life. But, uh, you know, to get away from it a bit, I, I was a big boater back in the, in, in the 80s. Oh, cool. So it's just kind of traveled with you through through the ages then. Yeah, yeah. No, it's boating is, you know, Jupiter, Jupiter, Florida is known for Jupiter Inlet. They have wow. a beautiful lighthouse there. It's very unusual to have a lighthouse in Florida, wow. uh, but it's a, it's a it's a beautiful in, it's a beautiful inlet, and it's uh, at times the water is so clear you can see the bottom fifty feet down. It's very much like the Bahamas sometimes. Not every night, not every day, but uh, we've seen it where we've gone out in the ocean and we saw probably forty or fifty turtles swimming around. And uh, yeah, it's a beautiful boating arena here. Very nice. Wow, you you are making me miss it. Let me tell you. I mean, it's been so long since I've been in sort of that tropical feel, been to Jamaica or been to Florida. I uh, when you say crystal clear water, that's like oh my gosh. Oh. So if you see me floating by on your when you're on your boat next time, don't be surprised. No worries. So, no, we're not leaving here. We love the ocean. We love the fishing. We love everything about the the outdoorsy life here and. Uh, we have a lot of friends here now. It's 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 home. This is it. I'm shooting a deep root here. Wonderful. Well, of course, you know, we, we, we want to know about your history. We want to know about your sporting career, but also about you. And so I want to take you back to your childhood days. Were you were you sporty as a kid? Uh, very much so. I grew up in South Africa and right. my parents, uh, my parents were farmers. We were sugar farmers and uh, in an area called Zululand, which is uh, sort of the area where the Zulu tribe is from. And uh, we all spoke Afrikaans as my main language. And Zulu was definitely also a language we spoke as kids. But uh, so I grew up in South Africa and we, you know, as a South African, you as a boy, you, you, you're you mad about rugby and all that. Right. So, uh, so that was kind of, uh, tennis was my hobby. When I, you know, I started very young, my parents introduced me to tennis because they were just club players playing on a Wednesday, Saturday and Sunday. And that's kind of how my tennis started. And I grew up in a very small town. But, you know, just like a story to so many of these other professional athletes, like a Djokovic and those types of people, um, you know, I came from absolutely uh, a very meager background in terms of uh, I was not exposed to tennis in a big city. I didn't have an academy. It was sort of uh, the love of the game crawled into my veins. And, you know, I was discovered. Uh, at age 11, 12, and then I said, listen, this kid needs to get out of where he is. I got a scholarship to a wonderful high school in Pretoria. In fact, it's the Afrikaans High School where Elon Musk went to the English school across the street. Oh, wow. 
<laughs> so it's a uh, small world, right? Everybody is now, everybody is now Elon Musk's cousin, you know. So right. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So <laughs> but uh, so that's kind of I went to Pretoria and that's where I uh, where my tennis really blossomed. I found a coach there by the name of Ian Cunningham, uh, who's since passed away a number of years back. But uh, Ian invited me. Uh, he emigrated from South Africa to get a job in Austria. Right. And uh, I followed him uh, three years after he arrived there. I followed him and uh, made my base in Austria when I was 17. Uh, decided that I was going to be a professional tennis player. I actually knew I was going to be a tennis player at age 14. And uh, I saw the South African Open for the first time in Ellis Park in Johannesburg. And, you know, I got Bjorn Borg's autograph. He was 16 years old and I got his autograph and. Uh, I thought, geez, you know, this kid should be in high school. He's already playing pro tennis. And uh, so I just knew that this is kind of things that really, really caught my attention. And I was absolutely smitten with the idea of playing professional tennis. Didn't know much about it. Uh, and then uh, little did I know, six years later, I played Borg in the semifinals of the U.S. Open. I know. What a journey. I mean, when you think back, uh, you know, you were really, like you said, more exposed to other sports like rugby. And then you was kind of just just doing this tennis thing as a hobby. What was it that, you know, just shot into your veins? Was it was it just seeing those other inspiring players or was there just something about being out there? Because I know a lot of athletes will say that just when I'm out there, it just feels different. Was there something like that within you? Right. I, I think that... Uh... I think you have to be a little bit crazy, you know, to, to, right. to go this route, frankly, to be truthful. Right. Uh, I was a very driven kid. I've always been uh, very much a loner type uh, that, uh, I mean, I was popular in school and I was sort of class captain a few times, but uh, I just was, um, I was just very, very driven. And I, uh, my mom always said, you know, you were one of those kids and I was the eldest of four. I was I was that kid that had the wanderlust. You know, I wanted to see what's across the horizon. And I just had the spirit of of uh, of exploration. And so, you know, I was taking chances. I was a bit of a risk taker. And, you know, so that's what kind of helped me a little bit and not being afraid to try new things and fail. And, uh, you know, I was a rugby player as well. And I did athletics in school. I was a multiple athlete multiple sport athlete and tennis was my hobby and then i got really really good at tennis and i uh, had to make a decision at age 15 whether i was going to play rugby or tennis because we had some national tournaments coming up and i picked tennis and uh it, it turned out okay yeah, so, uh, so what did so you that's kind of, you know that's kind of how it went right right so what was the deciding factor was it you know you got to pick. You got to make this decision right now at age fifty, which is pretty young to make basically a life decision. What made you? What tipped the scale for you? You know, rugby is a pretty rough sport, and um, <laughs> uh, I was uh, I was playing a winger. I was a uh, number twelve or thirteen, so I was right. uh, I was one of the very fast runners in rugby, and uh, you know, and I was playing for the school, and I was uh, I was pretty good. And uh, we had a national tennis tournament the same weekend that we had a big rugby tournament. So the two clashed. And uh, I happened to see the other team. I think at that time there was an international junior squad that came from France, I think, to play against South Africa. And they said, you know, uh, you know, you gotta, you got to try out to play uh, uh, for, uh, for some of the best kids in the country are going to try out for this, for this rugby game. And, and I saw them. I saw the other team flew in, and they practiced uh, at the at the rugby stadium. And my tennis training facility was really close to it. Right. And I saw these guys under fifteen with full beards. I'm like, man, they are not fifteen years old. These guys are eighteen, twenty, whatever. And we were gonna get slaughtered. We we're gonna get slaughtered. So I got a bit scared, and just as rightfully so, uh, they did get slaughtered. I think, but uh, uh, I ended up picking the tennis tournament. So that was kind of like. Uh, a very interesting decision and it just sort of split off and that's that was the that was the end of it so a bit of self-preservation there i think i would say so yeah <laughs> and a good choice for the for the world see being able to see you play now once you did make that choice to be professional did you start traveling straight straight away or were most of your um events local no i uh you know i was still in high school at age 15 so when i stopped playing rugby i was a, i was about 15 years old and then two more years went past and, you know, I played school tennis. I was uh, in this very uh, tough high school uh, academically. It's called Afrikaans Boys High in Pretoria. It's now called Afis or whatever. It's uh, Afrikaans school. 
But uh, I ended up um, uh, moving to Austria when I was 17. I didn't finish my final year in high school. I decided that I really wanted to try tennis and actually uh, moved to Austria where my coach was. And I stayed with his family in their flat. And uh, very shortly after that, I had no money and I had to, you know, find money to do my own thing. And so I started coaching a little bit uh, while training with my coach. And so I would buy enough. I would I would earn enough money coaching the little kids and adults and da, 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 when I was 17, 18 years old to uh, buy airline tickets and travel uh, to different parts of uh, England. And I went to France by train. I played in Switzerland a lot, Germany, mm-hmm. Austria, obviously. And uh, even went to West Berlin one time, even though it was communism at that time with East Berlin. So it was a very interesting time to be uh, in Austria from 1976 to 1978. In 1978, I came to Florida to play for five weeks in a, in a Florida circuit and ended up uh, – uh, never leaving. I mean, it was uh, one of those amazing stories. Wow. I mean, you were not even 18 yet and you were travel, you were world travel. That's, that's really amazing. What is the, what is that experience like? I mean, because I've been to South Africa, I have actually been to Stellenbosch. We would do our warm weather trainings there. So we'd stay a month or so. So on two occasions I've, I've been over there and it's very, very different from Austria. What was that transition like for you? I'm sure. Did you know Austrian? How was it like getting to know the language, the people, the culture? Even for me, moving from England to the US was a culture shock. How was that as a 17 year old um, transitioning to basically a completely different world? Yeah, it was a, it was a definite culture shock for me. I mean, obviously, speaking Afrikaans, a lot of German words are the same as an Afrikaans. Right. So uh, I would say within about six months to a year, I could speak fairly good at German. Uh, and uh, I had an ear for languages, so uh, you know I, I speak German pretty well now. But uh, so I, uh, I would say uh, that was a really tough thing. Sorry, my dog is scratching the door. I got to let her in. Let, let her in. She's let her, her in. Come on. She's gonna eat my house. Hang on. Bring her in. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Yeah, she's like, got to do an interview. She's got to do the interview as well. It's like so. you think you're gonna be on TV without me? I don't think so. <laughs> She follows me like my shadow. But What's your uh, dog's yeah, name? So, uh, this is Cutie. Cutie. And my daughter okay. always, when my daughter was four years old, she would say, uh, they, people would ask, what is your doggy's name? And she goes, Cutie with a K. You know? <laughs> oh, man. Anyway. Right, right. So, yeah, you were but, saying it was, it was a culture shock. It was, you know, quite a transition for you. Yeah, it was. Uh, but, you know, it was, for me, it was really, uh, I, I'm an adventurous type. And, um, you know, it was, t- it was tough at times. It wasn't always easy. But, uh, you know, I saw the world by myself. I was a very independent uh, kid anyway. And so this was this was just uh, an amazing time in my life that I look back at. And it was funny enough, I was talking to my partner who's actually from London. Right. And uh, had moved here permanently. So uh, we were talking about the tennis tour. He was a professional player as well, a little generation and a half before me. But... Um, very uh it, it was uh, for me it was like an adventure really it wasn't right. scary sometimes i ran out of money and i would have to call my mom when i'm in norwich <laughs> up in the north of england and i would take a train down to uh to piccadilly and i had 50 pence in my pocket so i said you know what before i buy a hot dog i better call my mom for some more money <laughs> Good choice. Good money management skills there. <laughs> little, little weight loss, survival for another month or two, you know, that kind right, of thing. Right, right. So you had put had to have put a lot of trust, your family and yourself, had to have put a, a lot of trust in your coach. Um, you know, making that, that's a real big commitment to move all the way to Austria. What was that relationship like and how did it affect your ability to grow as an athlete at that point? You know, we're... We all have mentors in our life, and uh, I was lucky enough to have this guy, Ian Cunningham, who was uh, sort of my second dad and really understood me and understood my tennis and was a very, very good coach in South Africa, and quite a few players went through his stable, so to speak. And uh, I was uh, very lucky to have that uh, European uh, cornerstone in my career because I learned to play on red clay, which is quite different from playing on cement in South Africa, a very different type of tennis, sliding and slipping and uh, more patience. And I learned to play the game the, the right way. 
and uh, I was there for uh, three years, and then obviously I was get, I was getting better and better. So I was working with my coach. He wasn't really traveling with me because he had his own job. He had a wife and kids, and uh, so he did go to some tournaments in Europe with me, but not a lot. But he was more of a mentor to me. And so I would like he would work with me and I would take a train or a plane and I would go somewhere for a week or two or three. And then I would come back to Austria. And then in 1978, I flew to America for the first time in my life. I went I was supposed to go to Florida and they had the blizzard of 1978 in New York City. I couldn't land from the plane uh, in, oh from God. Zurich to New York. And I ended up in Montreal, Canada, stuck in a snowstorm for five days. Oh my and goodness. got to know people from uh, from Florida, uh, from Naples. I had no idea where Naples was at that time. Right. I was just my mind was set. I'm going to Miami, and then I have to take a Greyhound bus to Vero Beach, right. and that was my that was my that was and, uh, and so, uh, little did I know that I would make Naples, Florida, my home one day later. It was a pretty amazing story. Came full circle absolutely yeah. full circle so were you able to keep was he your coach throughout your career to the end or did you end up switching coaches at some point you know i was uh i no we to answer the question no he didn't stay with my with me for my full full career because he had a he had a full-time career being a coach and having his job in austria right. and uh, at those days we didn't make the money to really be able to afford a coach to travel with you right. full-time right. Right. Uh, you know, you can ask John McEnroe, Connors. They we, we didn't have Bjorn Borg. You know, he had Berglund a little bit, but that's kind of how we did it in those days. You know, we had we had a coach, but it was more a guy that sort of stayed in the town or wherever you're from or right. from the country that you're from. And then, you know, if you did super well at the U.S. Open or a Grand Slam, they they will show up. Or sometimes they did travel with the guys to those. But uh, right. I did not. I was. Uh, I did not have a coach like him traveling with me every single week. Right. But uh, so we uh, we kind of split uh, when I when I ended up in Florida and I never came back to Austria because I was I was sort of an overnight success. I um, to, to give you a quick timeline, <clears throat> I arrived in Florida in 1978 somewhere in February, mm -hmm. and I was playing a five week series of tournaments in Florida. Absolutely the lowest rank, lowest tournaments you can play trying to get on the on a, on a, on a, on a tour and uh, I was 19 years old and playing a lot of other 19 and 18 year olds and uh, John McEnroe was just on the tour for maybe six nine months or something like that he was already ahead of us right. but we didn't know who he was and I uh, ended up uh, doing very well after uh, the first five weeks and uh, I, got, I I came in third or fourth in points so I made enough points to make enough money from my little tournaments, every tournament was a week long, so it was five tournaments, so four wow. four regular tournaments with a Masters event at the end, and uh, so I made enough money. So, well, you know what? I'm going to extend my visa and play another five tournaments right after that in North South Carolina. Wow! So I did that, and um, I did really well. Like I think I came in second or third in points uh, for the circuit. So my ranking went from when I arrived in Florida in February. By the summer of June, July, I was ranked top 250 in the world from a ranking of 900. Wow. <laughs> so it was a rapid climb, wow. but it meant nothing. It meant nothing to be 250 in the world, really. Right. And uh, so I ended up playing a couple of more tournaments, uh, and then I started qualifying for real professional tournaments called Challengers. They were like $50,000 tournaments, $75,000 tournaments. Right. And... Uh, so my ranking got to be within striking distance, top top 200 of qualifying for the U.S. Open. I could get into the qualifying tournament nice. for the 1978 U.S. Open, which was the first year they moved it from Forest Hills to uh, Flushing Meadows on hard courts. Right. So I played the qualifying in 1978 in August in New York City uh, at Flushing Meadows, and I I won four rounds, qualified for the U.S. Open. And started climbing the ladder big time. I was on a on a high. I was playing really great tennis, and uh, I reached the quarterfinals as a brand new upstart youngster with a duffel bag that I had four months ago. And now suddenly I have suits asking me if they could manage me. <laughs> wow. So what do you think it was that really sort of see this shot of 
you know, climbing like that? Do you think it was more your mental game or your physical game or a combination of the two that really saw you be able to make that leap, like you said, from going from nobody to way up in the rankings? Is that, was that more of your, you, like you said, you had this really strong mental game as a kid or were there, is it more than that? I think it's a combination of those two things. Um, I was kind of a hothead player. I was a guy that had a bit of an attitude. <laughs> right. And uh, so, like I said before, I always preface to say that uh, you got to be a little crazy to get right. into this business. But uh, no, honestly, I was an incredible athlete. I was uh, very blessed to have my dad's genes. My dad was a great, great, great athlete. He was a, he was a rugby player. He should have been a, a Springbok rugby player, but he inherited the farm and ended up starting a family. So he was an incredible specimen of a human being, very, very strong, very powerful guy. Uh, I inherited his legs. I mean, everybody's always talking about, I was one of the fastest <laughs> guys on the tour, da, 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 da. Right. And, uh, you know, I was, I was kind of an anomaly because I was five foot eight and a half with high heels. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, I was like a very, I was a very aggressive player, which is unusual for a little guy, you know, back in the day we, we, you know, we, we had different types of players. Some play from the baseline. Borg was obviously a baseliner. Roscoe Tanner, John McEnroe were serving volleyers. I was sort of a right. – I played 80% eight, of my matches. I played serving volley or very aggressive, but I could also stay back and, and, and can rally. So I got to the semis of the French in 86. I had a hell of a run, and I lost to Lendl in the semis. He ended up winning the French that year. So I, I – I never grew up on clay, but I think it probably would have been my strongest. I would have been the Nadal of the day if I had grown up on it because it is yeah. a very different mental game than uh, playing fast court tennis. So, so to tell you the truth, I think it was, uh, I was just very blessed with being extremely fit. Uh, I was just uh, growing up on a farm. We had our own vegetables, you know, so I had a great lifestyle to start with. Um, and uh, being an outdoorsy person and, Growing up in a sub subtropical climate, you know, the hot weather in Florida didn't bother me. You know, I could last anything. And so I was a very, I was a very good athlete, a, a good specimen for tennis. So I think that was a big plus for me. Right. And then I had this attitude of never say die. And I, you know, I had an incredible five set record in my career from 18 and four. So I won 18 five set matches, lost only four in my career. So, um, you know, I just was, uh, I was a fighter and didn't always work out but in some matches, but for the most part, uh, I could last the distance. Right. So, so basically you had the one, two punch, you had the physicality and you had the mental attitude of a champion. So put those two together and it's like an unstoppable combination. So now because of that, you're rising up the ranks. Like you said, all the people in suits are coming after you. How do you handle that? How do you know who to trust, who to go with, who you should choose as a coach next? How do you make those big decisions that are now going to determine how the rest of your career goes? Wow. You know, that's, that's a heck of a question. Um, I can only tell you the truth because I'm brutally honest person. Yeah, I, like <laughs> I, was sitting, I was sitting at the U S open and it was the quarterfinal match that evening. And I had to play Vitas Gerolitis. Okay. Right. The, the sweetheart of New York city shows up in a Rolls Royce. I'm a guy with $500 in my wallet. I'm a, I'm an upstart. You know, and I remember walking to the center court and he had two state troopers in front of me with him in the middle. And I'm like this little lamb being led to the slaughterhouse. That's how I felt. Right. And that, that is, I got slaughtered. I got killed in three sets, but I ended up beating him a few years later and never lost him after that. So payback. <laughs> how do you, how do you make a decision who to trust and who to, you know, I mean, I had no idea that you can get managed. You know, I didn't know that there was right. IMG. Right. I didn't know that there was Advantage International at that time, which is now Octagon. Right. Um, so honestly, I was sitting there having lunch uh, with a friend and a guy walks by in a suit and he gives me a, he actually flipped the card in front of me and stood there for five seconds and said, my name is so-and-so I work for IMG. Uh, in Cleveland, if you need somebody to uh, represent you, here's my car. And he walks off. <laughs> right. And I said to the guy, what was that? You know, I, what is a manager? <laughs> and uh, so that was that. And so I put the card away and uh, in my wallet. And then literally five minutes later, another guy walks in. 
and his name is Lee Fentress. And he sat down and he says, you know, my, my name is Lee Fentress and I'm a, a part owner of uh, a sports management company in Washington. We are, uh, we are called Advantage International. And uh, we, sorry, that was ProServe. He was at that time, he was with ProServe, sorry. Right. And, uh, and he sat there and talked to me and asked if he could sit and, and talk. And I said, sure, absolutely. And that's the only reason I went with him is because the guy showed real true interest with me mm. and took the time and the effort to explain everything to me. Uh, if it was the other way around, I might have <laughs> I might have been an IMG client. I don't know. Right, but uh, right. that's, just how, that's just how the dice rolled, and that's how it happened. And so uh, I became a pro-serve athlete with him, with Donald Dell, Dell, Craigill, Fentress, and Benton. And uh, that was a law firm, and these guys all went to law school together, and they started a sports management company, and wow. and that's why I ended up with Advantage, and then later on it became a much bigger company, and they bought a bunch of others, and it became Octagon, and it's a massive company today. Wow, they're very big that's in amazing. China. So everywhere. you were there at the beginning, at the grassroots. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, yeah, if Leaf Interest uh, split off from uh, ProServe at one stage, but he was my agent, so I just stayed with him, and uh, right. they became uh, Advantage International, that became Octagon later on. And uh, yeah, so that was kind of the the business side of my sport that I was introduced to in a crash course. Right. And uh, you know, I had a meteoric rise. I mean, to go from 900 in the world in February to top uh, 50 in the world by the end of uh, 1978 was was uh, was very very rapid. Yeah, that's huge. Do you think there was some, you know, because obviously you, when you when you first started out, you were you hadn't gone through puberty yet. You think as you just grew into your fantastic genes that you got from your dad, that 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 helps as well. Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, it's you know, in any sport, I mean, you go through. Tennis is a very unique sport, in my opinion. It's very unique, more, more so than most, I think, is the, the ability that uh, it teaches you about life skills because mm. it's just you and the other guy on the court and you got screaming, 20,000 screaming people there watching you on a center court at the US Open or Wimbledon or something like that. And I was very fortunate that I played in the biggest stages of the world year after year, uh, did very well at Wimbledon, did very well at the Australian Open, did well at the French, did well at the... Uh, uh, at the US Open. So I played on all the Grand Slam courts uh, wow. many, many years. And, uh, you know, the first year or two when you're on the tour, even though you may have a meteoric rise, it's it's a different, it's altogether a very different situation to try and stay up there. Right. Um, Absolutely. You know, that it, it's kind of like, you know, it's it's kind of like you, you start a 100 meter race uh, but it's really you, you sprint and then you realize, oh, my goodness, I got another 25 and a half miles to go. <laughs> it's a marathon in the end of the day for your career. So, yeah, uh, you, you by trial and tribulations, uh, you know, a lot of losses because tennis is, you know, 120 guys play the tournament uh, at Wimbledon or US Open and the French and those and those Grand Slams and only one winner, you know, so 127 guys go home not too happy you know but uh so uh it teaches you about uh you know uh, perseverance uh steadfastness never say die um you know all the things that makes you a good champion you got to look at your diet you got to look at your training you got to pick your tournaments right uh, all of those things are uh, are a slice of life you know life is not always great and uh, so tennis is a very very unique sport that teaches you tremendous life skills and um, I try to impart that with our kids as I talk to them about my experiences and my experiences with other players and there's so many great examples of great people and not just in my tennis sport but also in other sports. Right, absolutely. And I can completely relate to what you were saying about, you know, staying at that top level. I remember one of my training partners used to always say, you know, it's easy to get an A, it's keeping the A <laughs> that is difficult to do. So I can totally relate to that. I want to go back to something you said earlier about the your manager actually sitting down and explaining to you what this was all about. And I find that during my career, I had those moments where I felt like I was more of a product than a human, you know, like people didn't see me as a human. The guy comes by, he just drops your car. You're just another athlete. Well, did you have that experience where at points in your career where you felt 
you know, just pulled as a, a you, as an athlete. No one says, hey, Johan, how are you? It's like, how's training? How, you know, no one really wants to about, know what's going on with you as a human being. Did you get have that experience or did you feel that people really cared about you as the person, not just the athlete? Yeah, I mean, uh, I can bet, best describe it as that, you know, when I first came into the sport, I was extremely naive. I'm from South Africa. I'm a farm boy. Right. Um, I did not live in hotels. I didn't stay in a hotel till I was uh, 16 years old right. uh, somewhere. And, you know, always home cooked meals. I mean, I completely grew up differently. I was not a city slicker, mm. um, but uh, I learned very quickly. Um, this is this tennis today is completely different than it was in the 80s when I played, even though that was a golden era. There's no question in my mind that, you know, from Ili Nastasi, Guillermo Villas to Connors, Borg, McEnroe, Lendl, Edberg, Becker, that era was, you know, from 1975 or 76, 77 on through to about 90s. That was an incredible, incredible fast growth area. The business of tennis was exploding. Yeah. Um, tennis players became superstars. The Borg McEnroe, uh, you know, was, was such an incredible time for, for those two guys. They they basically were leading the pack and Connors was in the mix. Obviously, he's a little bit older than those guys, but he was always around. And then Lendl came into the picture. I was around. You know, it was a very v vibrant area. And I think, you know, yeah, to answer your question, I think towards the latter part and maybe the three quarters through my career, it started, the business started to become the business, you know, and uh, I think that sort of innocence that I had as a younger a younger player that played for the freedom of this amazing sport and let me just be excited and see how well I can do against McEnroe, see how well I can do against Lendl or Connors or those guys, you know. I think a lot of that sort of fell away a little bit and it became just a business. Right. And uh, uh, that that was kind of a that was kind of a difficult period because I can honestly tell you if if you ask me how I played between 1987 and 88 in 89 i couldn't tell you I, I could not tell you even though i was still top 25 or so in the world i couldn't tell you what uh, what i did but i can certainly remember up to 1986 what i did most of the, every year and uh, but but the year of 87 and 88 i, I, I it's a it's a blur I, I i can't remember how i played i can't even remember great tournaments i played wow. it was just like uh, i was sort of a, a i was on automate uh, I was like an automat, I was like a robot, you know, I just kind of keep playing. So that came because of all the success you'd had. Like you said, it became more of a business. You're going to have more sponsorships. You're going to have all these people that want to manage this, want to manage that. Is that an inevitable thing or is there something that can be taught that will help an athlete deal with that so that they can still feel that passion and that spark that they had that got them to where they are in the first place? I think that's why we see, yeah, I, I would say that's absolutely correct. I think uh, if you look at how tennis is today, yeah. obviously the guys and the gals that are at the very top are making enormous amounts of money. They have the ability to afford uh, numerous people to be their team, uh, part of their team. Right. We were not like that. Uh, I got married very young and uh, I was 20 when I got married to an American gal and uh, I played most of my career with her uh, traveling with me. So that was my team. I was just a married guy and, uh, you know, I would find my own practice partners. I would do my own wash. I mean, there was a whole, you know, we had to pay for our own airfares. We had to pay for our own food. We paid for our, uh, most of it we paid for, you know, and uh, today the hotels are, uh, are free. The, 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 the tournaments provide food and transportation and you know many a times uh, the top guys get private jets pick them up and fly them around it's a completely different ball game right right so do you think that is a benefit because i know when i talk to some of the old school athletes from track and field they think that the newer generation are babies too much do you think, do you feel the same about tennis today or do you think, no, it's a necessary thing to protect them from what you went through? Oh boy, that's a pretty good question. Um, yeah, I would say, you know, every generation has, a, has an idea that they were the toughest and the meanest and the baddest, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, so true. 
but uh, I would say, you know, look, this is just a natural progression of everything in life. Yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, my kids, I have an eight year old boy and a nine and a 10 year old girl uh, with my second marriage. And um, my, my kids will probably never truly understand what I did and how I got there unless yeah. They see a documentary of, <laughs> made of me or something. <laughs> Netflix original. And, uh, you know, so uh, I hope that with COVID and stuff, I truly hope that I can go to South Africa in June and July this year because it's my 50th anniversary from my little school where I grew up and I went to Barefoot School in that little town of Pongola in uh, Zululand, South Africa. And uh, a lot of people want to go for this uh, anniversary or this uh, this reunion. 50th reunion, reunion. So uh, I really hope that I can go and take my kids and my wife and, and show them where daddy grew up. And, you know, the stories will probably be plenty, but, uh, yeah. uh, you know, I just think it's just, a no. I mean, I can't, I can't fault these guys for what they do now. I mean, this is just the way that the, the tennis has developed. You know, if you look at Wimbledon, you know, I'm good friends with Rod Laver, probably the biggest icon in tennis, uh, alive today. And, uh, I, I've been around Rod for for a few weeks. Uh, luckily, the last year or so, and talked to him at length about uh, his life and what he's done. And you know, back in the day, he, you know, he's that dry Australian sense of humor. And he said, you know, when he won Wimbledon, he says he got a firm handshake and a five-pound voucher to go buy a T-shirt from the museum. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, know, you so say that. <laughs> You know, now these guys are getting four million dollar paychecks. You know, the private jets are fueled. They got two pilots. They got a hairdresser, a nail salon ready. They got the massage therapist on the plane. They got the toenail clipper out. They got this out, that out. You know, I wish I had that. I mean, who wouldn't want that, right? Who wouldn't want to have a massage at thirty five thousand feet going home? You know, I mean, who wants to sit in a cramped little, you know, G six fifty? I mean, who the hell wants to do that? Just to get a Boeing seven five seven, you know. I love it. You know, I was talking to a fellow athlete as well the other day. We were talking about winning sausages. Like we got prizes that were sausages and coffee mugs. We're like, we can't cash this in. We can't buy anything with these sausages. And we probably can't even get them on the plane. So yeah, absolutely. Totally different era. Totally different era. But but like you said, it was an amazing era. It was the golden era of tennis. And you talked about some of the greats. What was it like when you knew that you were going up against a big name. Were, were you confident going into those into those matches or was there some, you know, angst going up against some of the greats of that era? Oh, I think it was absolutely a paella of feelings, honestly. Uh, right. You know, um, when you go and play a top player, like a number one or two or three person in the world and you're ranked 35th in the world, you know, everybody gives you zero chance to win. Right. And, uh, you know, that you read the papers and they just destroy you. And they go, oh, you know, Macron's going to go through, or Connor's going to go through, and da, 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 da. Right. But uh, I was kind of a hard knucklehead, you know. I, uh, I, I was very, they called me the dark horse or the giant killer because I was very dangerous playing these super top guys because I was an athlete that was faster than them, probably in many ways fitter than them. So I had a bit of a, I had a bit of a, a, a one up on them in many ways. But, um, uh, you know, when I was climbing the ladder, until you get there and you start beating these guys, uh, you know, you don't know how good you are until you start beating the number one or two or three player in the world or top 10 players. Right. And right. Uh, once you kind of gain that little bit of edge or you gain that confidence in yourself to show that, you know, I just beat, I was ranked 35th in the world and I just beat number five in the world. You feel honestly emboldened that, hey, I should probably belong amongst those guys. Right. Right. And uh, like I said, you know, I just keep chipping away, chipping away. And I ended up being seven in the world. And I was there between seven and 15 for four or five years. And I was never lower than 30, 35 in the world, which is, I, play, I was number 35 in the world when I was age 34. And here's Roger Federer. He's probably top three in the world at age 30, 39. It's just uh, shows you how the fitness and all those type of things have changed over the years. Uh, when I was 34 years old, I was injured, unfortunately, but uh, had surgery on my elbow. So that took me off the tour permanently. But I was already on a senior tour at age 35. Here, Roger Federer is still playing and he's 40 years old. I mean, it's just unbelievable what the guys have been able to do fitness-wise, diet-wise. He's probably a big anomaly to this to this fact. But, uh, you know, obviously he has the best doctors, the best people looking after him. He's got a unique body for the sport of tennis. And, uh, you know, so... 
But still, the guys are playing amazing tennis. Nadal, Djokovic, these guys are amazing athletes, amazing ambassadors for the game. Serena Williams, you know, look at her. She's 40 years old and still playing. And, you know, I saw uh, Venus Williams lives, her dad lives not far from my house in the same neighborhood. So I, my kids sometimes see Venus Williams practice here on the court around the corner from us. Wow. In our neighborhood. It's a neighborhood court. So my kids practice on the same court Venus Williams is playing. That's funny as hell. That's but nice. uh, so, uh, yeah, you know, it's just, uh, it's a very different ball game today. Uh, they play with uh, very, very uh, different equipment like us. Uh, the, gra- the graphite rackets haven't changed much, but the stringing, the way that the coaches teach the game of tennis today, it's a very, very, very physical, very hard hitting. Uh, finesse is uh, something of, uh, of of an old black and white picture, but uh, uh, you know Roger Federer is just an anomaly that can sort of blend new style tennis with the old style flair, and the way he carries himself on the court is kind of a nostalgic look to the 1980s, perhaps you know. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, so uh, you know, it's a, just a different game today. The way they play, it's just it's brutal. It's physical and. Uh, yeah, quite different from when we play. Right. I remember actually reading something that you wrote, uh, and, and it was during this era, and you were saying that you had what you called an off year. It was like an off year. I guess things weren't going right for you that year. Did you ever, were you ever able to figure out, like, how do you, when you're having an off year, is there that panic that, oh gosh, is this going to continue forever? Is this the beginning of the end? And how do you figure out what it is that's that's keeping you off of your game? You know, I think my off year came uh, towards the end of my career. Um, I, I just think I was burnt out and I didn't recognize it and I didn't uh, I didn't take the appropriate steps and I didn't have a, a team that could see that. You know, it was mm-hmm. just, you just kind of keep going because you got to make money and uh, you got to play and this is my job. And, you know, um, it, 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 you, you know, when you live out of a suitcase, it's not easy, you know, and when you're already, say, 12, 14 years into it, it's not easy to, to, you know, you have a house in Florida and you want to get home, you know, and uh, it's just not, uh, it's not the same uh, uh, intensity perhaps. And uh, you need a break sometimes. And then sometimes it's, uh, it could be as simple as changing a coach perhaps in the new, in the new age. Uh, it right. could be, uh, you know, a, a number of things, maybe a different uh, trade training regiment. It could be anything to spark you up to be excited about being on the court again. I just think I, I lost a little bit of my, my spark. Uh, my genius was more my athleticism, but uh, I, I, I needed, uh, I needed to have uh, more than just the athleticism. I needed something to, to look forward to. And I think sometimes, you know, you just do it so long that you, you get tired of it. And I can totally see why Borg quit when he was young. You know, he could, he right. played only, about 10 years on a tour, which was extremely short, even for us in in 1980s. So, uh, but he's a legend. Uh, Bjorn is a friend of mine, uh, an amazing athlete, an amazing, uh, amazing player. Uh, Tremendous, tremendous respect for a guy like that, uh, for what he's done in such a short span of time. But, uh, you know, everybody has a story to tell. And, uh, you know, I had a story with McEnroe. The first tournament that McEnroe ever won, he beat me in the finals in Hartford, Connecticut or in Stanford, right. something like that. And uh, so I had a bit of a track record with John. I beat him a few times. He beat me most of the time. But that's why he was number one in the world and I was number seven in the world. But he didn't like playing me because I was, I was, <laughs> I was, a, I was a dangerous player for him. When you beat him the first time, did your confidence level just skyrocket? Oh yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, uh, the first time I I beat John McEnroe was in 1982, in the finals of the U.S. National Indoor Championships, which was the winter tournament in Memphis, Tennessee. Right. So the U.S. National Indoor Championships, and uh, I had just won the Australian Open in, ja- in January of '82, and I played McEnroe in uh, March. He was the number one player in the world, and I and we played on a hard court indoors. Obviously, it was cold. And um, I beat him 6-4 and a third on national television. And I just knew that I was playing the best tennis of my life at that point in time. So that was really, really a great confidence booster for me. It put me on a map. I was uh, amongst the best players in the world. And, uh, and that, was a, that, that was a huge milestone for me, no question in my mind. Amazing. 
So when you were preparing for big, big matches like Grand Slams, was it a lot different from, you know, just the, the, the matches that would you would play leading up to that? How was what's the preparation like for an athlete in that sense for you? Yeah, um, obviously the Australian Open was played uh, when I played. It was I have sort of a very strange anomaly. I, I won the 1981 uh, Australian Open. Right. Uh, in uh, it started in December of 1981, and then the finals was after New Year's in '82. Wow! So I won. Then I moved the date for the Australian Open for 1982 to be completely in 1982 in December. So I won the Australian Open against the same opponent on the same calendar year. <clears throat> wow! <laughs> that was which is quite an accomplishment. A little bit of trivia. A little bit yeah. of trivia, but. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. So, uh, you know, the, the preparation for the Australian, because I lived in Florida, that was not a big deal for me because the Australian Open was in December or January. It's extremely hot, 110 degrees. Uh, you know, I trained in Florida, and uh, so that made total sense. <clears throat> the, the French Open obviously was not that big a deal for me. I played in uh, I played in Europe in the spring. So February, March, April, I would, I, I would be in Europe anyway. Right. Then I would come home for about a month and and train really hard on clay, play with dead balls and stuff like that. <clears throat> Excuse me, go to the gym a lot and uh, really get strong for the French. And then I would just stay because I would play the French and then I would play Queens or I would take a week off, play Wimbledon. <clears throat> so it was uh, it was a long six weeks in the, in the summer in England. Right, right. So if you could like be you today knowing everything you know and go back to Johan in his heyday. Is there anything you would change about your career? And was, would you give him any particular advice? Um, I was a free spirit. You know, I don't think I could have given myself advice. I was a knucklehead. I wanted to do things my way. And, you know, my, because when you grow up and, uh, and you, you break every barrier, in that arena that you're in and people yeah. say, Oh, you know what? Look at him. He's short. He's not going to be a tennis player. Uh, well, you know, he doesn't speak English. He's speaking Afrikaans, you know? So I had a lot of no's in my life. And so my instinct and my gut instincts was really what guided me. Right. So I don't think I could have really changed anything. I think you are a product of where you're from. I believe very strongly. Uh, doesn't mean that there's influences from anywhere else that doesn't change it. But I think that, uh, you know, uh, McEnroe was McEnroe, Connors was Connors, Lendl was Lendl. We all come from different backgrounds and we happen to love the same sport. And, you know, we ended up on the same lines and doing the same, the same rules. And, uh, but we're all different flavors. And, uh, you know, there was nobody more difficult to play than Jimmy Connors, in my opinion, because he was such a fighter. I mean, he was just, you know, so I learned from those experiences and I don't think I was sort of a solitary, very, very talented guy that didn't need a lot of coaching. McEnroe was the same way. You know, Connors was coached by his mom and his grandma. I mean, so everybody comes from a very different background back then. It's quite different now. Obviously, they got professional coaches traveling. This guy is an expert in the forehand. This guy is an expert in this and that. Psychologists travel with people. You know, I mean, when we lost, we just go and drink a few beers and drown your sorrows and try and pick yourself up the next day. You're sore as hell. Maybe you just go for a light jog, we, you know, something like that. And uh, we just didn't have the, the professional side of things like they are today. And uh, so I don't think I would have been able to give myself too much advice because I know how I was as a youngster. <laughs> and how I, figured I, I was just a, I was just very driven, I would right. say that. Right. So you actually started coaching, like you said, back in when you were younger to make ends meet. So of course, I'm assuming you had to kind of put that aside once your career really started to take off. Like most athletes, you said you, the injuries kind of ended your career before you would, you would have had it. Was coaching a natural uh, next step then? Was that always going to be your safety net? Or was that again, another thing that you were doing to make ends meet at that point? Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, 
uh, I, I was always a I was always a card. Even though I was a very uh, very driven personality, I was I was always funny and always could tell a great story. And the old creek men on the creek side, the old bunch of funny guys, tough as nails, and uh, very good storytellers. So. Right. For me to coach, when I learned from my coach and from other coaches around me in Austria when I was there as an 18, 19 year old, 17 year old, I learned how to coach. And that came in very handy when I decided, you know what, I like to work with kids. I got to stay busy. What do I know? Tennis, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go to Wharton School of Business. It's not what I do. And uh, so uh, I started coaching uh, in 2000. Seven. I actually had a day job for five years. I worked for one of the largest sports, sorry, one of the largest development companies in Florida for five years called WCI Communities. And I uh, learned a lot about the world of uh, real estate sales and marketing and all of those wonderful things. And uh, then the world economy collapsed in 2008 and 2,400 employees in that company lost their jobs and I was one of them. Wow. So I went through that pain and then I said, you know what? I don't really like to work for anybody else. I'm more of an entrepreneurial spirit. I like to do things. So I ended up coaching and starting my academy. I was I was going to build a $300 million sports complex in Sarasota, Florida in 2008 and nine, and the world economy collapsed in 2008, blew that one out the door. So, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm very fortunate that I was able to uh, to forge ahead with my own tennis academy and had a wonderful time in different cities. A couple of cities. I was in North Carolina. I was in Virginia, and I, now I'm back in Florida. Wow. But uh, like I said, my my last two rows here. I got a wonderful, wonderful partner in my business. Uh, his name is David Lloyd. He's probably the world's best tennis entrepreneur. He's British. Uh, he's moved to Florida permanently to work with me. Uh, we are partners in our ventures, and uh, we are. I mean, I have not been this excited in many uh, you know since I started playing on a tour. I've learned from David. I've learned from myself. I've learned how to do things in business. Um, and I hope I leave a legacy for my kids, you know, because uh, this is something extremely, extremely exciting that we are embarking on, me and David. And uh, I, can't, I can't wait. We are way down the road. I, I, I don't want to jinx it, but we are working on some incredible projects in Texas and in Florida. So... Um, yeah, that's my uh, that's my new found love, and what I want to do with David is extraordinary. So, and he's a fantastic guy, amazing, amazing, amazing businessman, and uh, you know, I'm very fortunate to call him my friend and also my business partner. And uh, we are looking forward to uh, do some amazing things in tennis and uh, and and beyond that as well. That's fantastic. So, yeah, tell me more about your academy. What who what age groups do you serve? What kind of events do you do? Events do you do? I saw you have a cup. Uh, tell us all about the the academy and how it functions and who you serve. Yeah, um, well, we have a. Uh, I have a small tennis academy. I um, uh, it it obviously took a huge hit with COVID because you know for a while there we were shut down in the summer uh, for about uh, two and a half months. So. Um, you know, we had to rebrand ourselves in a different way, and different uh, different programs had to be implemented. So, we are we are back on a growth pattern. It's uh, you know, I don't uh, I don't run my academy for uh, finding the next Nadal or, or Serena Williams. It's just a, it's a it's not that type of thing for us. Uh, we have the ability to work with the best juniors in the world, but honestly, with COVID and all that, I've always marketed myself as a tennis academy for the local market and people can come from the regional areas. And I've also, when I was in Sarasota, I mean, I had kids from all over the world come to us. And uh, I have a couple of international kids here that work with us as well. My coaches are varied. I have a lot of women coaches from, uh, I have coaches from Serbia, from Venezuela, from uh, uh, Poland as well. So, uh, you know, we are quite diversified, but uh, you know, we, we run a small outfit and we keep it real nice and tidy. And uh, we have a blast, you know. And for me, the most important thing is, is to, to see a kid get into the game at age four or five. I have a huge quick start program for a lot of little kids. And, uh, you know, they are, it's so fun to see these kids pick up a racket for the first time, didn't know which end to hit the ball with. And then you see them grow. And, you know, I've had some amazing success with, uh, with some of the kids I had in my academy. I had one, one girl in North Carolina 
Um, I, I started her when she was eight and we left when she was uh, 14, but she ended up going in North Carolina and uh, 84 and zero match record. That's amazing. In, uh, it's funny school. you talk I'm, about the little ones. I saw a post that you did, and I, I, I feel like the tennis racket was bigger than the little girl that you were showing us a picture of. <laughs> they really start. Yeah, having... no, it's it's really great to see them, you know, mature into their own tennis, and you just never know who is going to make it to college or who is going to make it to the pros. The pros are a whole different ballgame nowadays. Right. It is an enormous amount of money to make it. Uh, it's a different deal than when I made it, but. Uh, you know, I just really enjoy living in this part of Florida. We we absolutely love the outdoors, the, the, the ocean, the beaches, the this, the that. The weather here is incredible. Phenomenal people. There are hundreds of golfers here that are professional. I need some more tennis guys. Can you send me some, please? I mean, I'm <laughs> we'll overrun with tiny do. little I'm, run, I, I'm Tiger Woods is here, and I got <laughs> Louis Westlake and Schartzel, any else. I got Greg Norman, Jack Nicholas. I got everybody here. Gary Player. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I need some more help. It's just me and Serena and Venus. No, We're no, no. <laughs> we going to find you some more tennis for sure. We'll, we'll put we'll put the word out for you. <laughs> Thank you. I, I much appreciate it. Now, I remember seeing you uh, give some recognition. Speaking of the, the, the youth that you work with, um, too, I think it was Eleanor Zhao. And you had mentioned that you had been training her since 2018. At that time, I think she was ranked 150 and she was now ranked number one is that a common a common thing that, i mean do you see your your athletes growing like that a lot or is this something that you have to really work hard to find these gems or and and, and how much how much does your influence play into their ability to make those types of of phenomenal advancements you know i think uh you don't know when you when you see a young a young boy or a young girl come to your academy age 10 12 13 14 you know you don't know exactly what the end result's going to be right. you know uh, i think uh, in an academy business it's a it's it, it's it's more of a group training but then you f maybe find those unique nuggets of uh, of excellence that would would explode and do something else differently from some most of the other kids you know there's only one number one in the world <laughs> There's only one number two in the world. And so, um, you know, my, my goal is to make the kids love the game. Uh, I want them to have, I always call it the, a full toolbox of tennis shots. So I'm very technical. I'm very, very, very strong on that front in terms of making sure that, you know, whatever shot they need, they can execute. Right. That's number one. Number two, uh, the mental side of the sport is enormously important. And, it is a subject matter that is much, much more addressed now in the juniors. However, I think there's a lot of people that are basically, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a difficult thing to teach. You know, I think a, a guy like me and, and, and many others in my position, and there's not enough of my caliber of players coaching because, uh, you know, we have really an, an authenticity that is very hard to match. Right. Um, you know, how is a guy or a girl really going to talk about how does how how is this kid going to feel in the semifinals of a Grand Slam? You know, um, can 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 a can a coach that has only watched tennis or do that can he truly inspire that child to know exactly what it feels like? So if I talk about my experiences and what happened to me when I won, when I lost, that has big authenticity value to a child right. or a young player. So, uh, so you know, those are the values that I bring to the table. But honestly, I think uh, everybody has their own curve of, of learning, their own way of getting better. And you can just give them all the knowledge and all the encouragement and all the talks and all the, all the heartache of sitting next to a court and see them win, see them lose, cry a little bit with them, you know. But uh, at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's, it's up to them. They are hitting the ball. They have to go out there. They have to have the experience to know what to do next. Right. So, <clears throat> so that's kind of what I look at. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, when, you get a, when you get a really great player, it's actually another difficult thing to do because, uh, you know, you want to travel with them, but you're running an academy business. So it's not so easy. So we always try and find wonderful young coaches that work with us that can go with these kids and I've, you know, I've sent kids to ITF tournaments with coaches and so forth. So uh, it's a whole different animal when you have a really, really great little player that, you know, can go somewhere 
And uh, it's still a long way from Wimbledon and Senna Courts, but, uh, you know, it, it can be done. Right. Do you think teaching mental toughness is something that when you look at the athlete, they have to have some sort of passion or natural mental toughness or, you know, a mental game already kind of raw there already? Like you had, you were, nobody really had to teach you. You were a go-getter just right out the gate. Do you think if someone doesn't have that type of spirit, it can be taught, mental toughness can be taught, Mental, the mental side of the game can be taught, or do you think there has to be sort of like some existing level of that in order for there to be something you can shape? Because I know there's always this argument between nature and nurture. What, what's your thoughts on that? You know, I, I've... Uh... I've thought so much over the last 15 years about the mental side of tennis and, 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 and what is what is the best way to go forward with that. Right. Honestly, it's a, tennis coaching is a part art and a part science. Mm. Uh, what I'm very, very good at is, is, uh, is, is really the art part, funny enough. I, didn't, I did not have the art part when I played down. Oh. I think if I had the art part down and I had a team or a coach that could travel with me and kind of make this raging Congo River uh, <laughs> flow in a certain direction and bowl people over, that would have been better than trying to, you know, turn on my own self. But uh, so I didn't really have, I did not have, uh, I, I, n not that it was anybody's fault. It was just, I think I could have been probably number one in the world if I had the right mental coach to for many reasons hold my hand and and and, and lead me in a way that uh, I, I was just a, I was just absolutely a free spirit I was just let's try let's try and uh, right. that's great but I think hindsight is always 2020 but I think if I had somebody um, that was a, 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 a guy like a Leonard Berglund who helped Borg and so forth become number one in the world, and uh, some of the other people that w were really great support. I, I really didn't go that route. Right. And uh, it's not that I didn't want anybody. It just it didn't play into the – it just didn't happen. And uh, so today's world, I mean, you know, let me take Andre Agassi for an example because he played, you know, he had basically two careers. So the first career he played, he got to number three in the world. I played him a few times. I beat him. He beat me. I never played him in his second career because I basically uh, had retired by then. Right. But that just shows you, you know, he went from number three in the world, world at his feet, you know, Nike pays him incredible amounts of money. He was, he had everything, but he wasn't mature. He wasn't, he, he wasn't, he, he, the, the river wasn't flowing right. Right. And it was overflowing its banks. I think he was, he was totally overwhelmed, I think, by all this stuff because he was such an iconic player. And if you don't have somebody strong that can help you, uh, I would say kind of cut through the chaff, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Let all the noise go away and you focus on some things that are really important for your career long term. Andre almost lost it, wow. I think, looking from the outside. And I was not an insider, but I knew enough. But, wow. uh, you know, he came back on his second career he decided that he needed to show himself the truth about who he was, and he did not ask for wild cards. He actually got to play challenger tournaments, qualified for them, and started rebuilding himself. Mm -hmm. And he showed himself, and it was his desire to do it. And uh, that, to me, tells me that, yes, the mental side of tennis can be taught. Does it help to have you know, some sort of a talent that you are a tough cookie anyway, that you can take a punch mentally. You know, you could lose a heartbreaking five-hour match and still come back and play and win tournaments after that, you know. Right. that That's just resiliency. You know, that's just a guy that can take a punch, basically. Right. Uh, I've seen so many one-shot wonders where a kid, you know, has a heartbreak, shot, a heartbreak match and then, they, you know, they maybe win a big tournament and never be heard from again. Right. And that's happened quite a bit in, in tennis as well. But, uh, you know, Andre is a good example for me, at least, that, uh, you know, you can, you, with, the right, with the right attitude, the right truth within yourself, that uh, the mental side of tennis can be, can be taught and can be, uh, 
helping you a, a lot and pushing you through to to a whole different level that you didn't even know you could do that's great that's great i love that perspective so as a coach for you what would you say is the most challenging part of it all as a coach i would say uh my coaching is like a like a tripod chair there's the coach there's the child and there's the parents if Uh-oh. any one of those <laughs> if any one of those don't really if one if one leg goes short or falls away the chair is not going to stand up right so uh it's a it's a, it's a <clears throat> It's uh, at times extremely challenging to deal with all three because obviously I, I run a business, so I have other coaches, it's not just me. So you have the business side, you got uh, you got expectation side on the parents, and you know you can have parents that are just the most wonderful people. <clears throat> they drop their kid off, they pay on time, they are almost friends of yours. They don't really involve themselves too much they go to tournaments they don't bitch and moan they're just really great people and you still have to connect with them and talk to them about what's going on with their child it's extremely important that you have open communications right. you may have parents sometimes that are uh, too involved you know so you have uh, a to z uh, flavor of parents you know some parents uh, the dad is not involved but the mom is overbearing and you know all sorts of things that can go on so it's a real challenging uh, environment constantly to balance this chair. Right, right. So constantly having to sort of, uh, I mean, I've worked with kids a lot. So as soon as you said parents, that's why I was like, uh-oh, <laughs> the parents, that leg can be super, super, super challenging. But like you said, we are working with little ones as well and they go through all yeah. sorts of emotions. Now, I was I was thinking, um, you know, just about the whole the tennis versus track. And I was thinking about with performance enhancing drugs in track and field, it's like a constant battle. Like every single year, there's something going on with that. Is that something that's pre- prevalent in tennis, too? Or is it a pretty, pretty clean sport for lack of a better phrase in terms of what people are doing in that respect is there a lot of testing and what's that side of the sporting world like or do you not have to deal with that a lot because you you're mostly with the little ones yeah obviously i'm not i'm not dealing with any of that stuff at this moment and i hope never to have to but i am uh, i'm very aware of what's going on but uh, you know tennis is absolutely not immune to lots of things that's going on uh what we would say basically is some illegal stuff because uh, I think the biggest, uh, you know, we have uh, we have uh, we have agencies that are um, dealing with uh, illegal betting and all sorts of things that was wow. found out uh, that was found out how even umpires uh, between television being shown in a certain country that there's a few seconds lag time between calling the score and these guys would bet in incremental seconds. Oh my gosh! So, yeah, I mean, it's wow. just amazing what people what people would find out. So, yeah. so there's uh, there's uh, there's organisations within the ATP. There's organisations that are independent that are actually taking care of uh, illegal stuff like that. We have to take care of that because there's there's been attacks on players, not only on social media. There's been some very ugly stuff that happens with betting. Right. So we know that's going on. Um, uh, you know, so. And yet you find that sometimes there's betting companies sponsoring tennis tournaments. So I don't know exactly where you draw the line for for the actual ethics of it, you know. Right. Uh, that's right. not for me to decide. That's for the big owners of our sport and the big dogs to decide what is the best way to forward. But I find that kind of interesting yeah. that we have that type of stuff. Um, sp- enhancing drugs for our sport. Uh, when I played, you know, I took an aspirin for a headache. That's about it. There was none of this stuff when I played, uh, right. you know, recreational drugs, you know, that I'm sure that, that no different from the general populace at parties or whatever in the eighties. Uh, I'm sure that was part of it. I never participated in it. I was just never into that at all. And, uh, I think that, uh, in today's world of sports, I think, uh, you know, We've seen we've seen what happened with some of uh, the people like a Lance Armstrong. What happened for so many decades? You know, he was clean, he was clean, he was clean. Everybody was saying clean, and then he got caught. Right. So you know, I can't say that tennis at this stage. And my and, and what I see is that there's a lot of this stuff going on. There's there's rumors. There's this, but 
you know, I don't know. I just don't know. I just know when I play that if you play a five set match, it is extremely hard to recover real quick. Yeah. And, uh, you know, but we, we, we still played, we tried to recover. I think it's not so much the performance enhancing. I think it's the recovery stuff that they are so worried about. And so athletes are, you know, I don't know. Um, I, I just don't have proof that they are guys doing things. And that's just, the. Uh, I think there's, uh, there's, you know, there's, there's very big scrutiny from uh, the bosses of our sport to make sure that these things don't, don't, uh, don't get out of hand and that, uh, you know, they test the players and there's a lot of stuff that's going on. So, that they test the people for, for, for these performance enhancing drugs. I don't even know what the hell they call it, frankly. <laughs> um, but uh, it's, uh, you know, tennis is not immune. I think it's the same issues with a lot of other sports, you know. So I assume it's creeped into our sport as well, but I'm not at that echelon of knowing an inside mm-hmm. scoop on everything. Uh, but I assume that there's, you know, I know for a fact that people are being tested all the time. Right, right. Now, speaking of um, the bosses of our sport, I know that about a year ago or so, you mentioned that you felt that the ITF was in trouble in many ways. What were some of the things that you took issue with? And and do you feel like things are now improving? Oh, boy. How much time do you have? (laughs) (laughs) you got a few minutes. Uh, I'm a bit of a political animal. I mean, uh, I'm a voracious reader. Uh, I love my sport. I love life. I mean, I'm a I'm a 63 year old crazy guy. I love my life. I love my wife, my kids. Yeah. And, you know, I'm I'm a political animal a little bit now. I see what's happening in the world. It's not it's not too pretty looking around me, but uh, what I see. But uh, you know, I mean, look, there's always politics and everything. That's just the nature of the beast. Um, I do think our sport is truly an international sport for both men and women. Whether you like it or not, I think that tennis is is very much uh, trying to fight for its slice of the pie globally in terms of income and all that stuff. You know, there's so many new things that kids are involved with. I mean, we're talking about the Red Bull sports stuff, yeah. the uh, the extreme stuff. The 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 you know, we have esports now. You get colleges that are now giving uh, scholarships for esports. I mean, these things did not exist in the '80s, right? And we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have all these games and phones and iPads and, and computers. And, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things that are grabbing our young youth's attention now. And I don't know, many times I think, what, where are we going with this? I mean, yeah. it's, is it yeah. good? Is it bad? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, so tennis is not immune to major changes. And uh, I think that uh, the impact that COVID has had is not done yet. I mean, I think... Right. Uh, I look around, man. We just had the Delray 250 tournament uh, this past week. I played an exhibition Monday a week ago. And, uh, you know, there were 100 people in the stands. Wow. I mean, how are we going to continue pumping out millions of dollars of prize money for, uh, you know, maybe the companies don't mind just being on television with no spectators? But I know for a fact that about a third of the income from these Grand Slam tournaments come from spectators buying stuff and buying tickets. Yeah, yeah. So they take a huge hit unless they have insurance policies. They've taken a huge hit in income. So, and that's that goes for every tournament because now you have to be six feet apart. They don't, you know, they can never go back to full capacity. Right. You know, is there going to be more strains of the virus coming out? I mean, I I think that sports in general is in serious trouble for the next year. Yeah, yeah. The next foreseeable future. Let me rephrase that. I think it's for the for the foreseeable future, future now on a uh, on a on a level of not professional tennis but uh, just the recreational tennis uh, sport the, the sports of tennis and maybe some of the others like padel or pickleball uh, they've become sort of the the sports de jour for the covid time because right. you're six feet apart you're outdoors you know right and so so in that sense we've 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 got a vibrant tennis business on that side of the that lane of tennis and so so we do fairly good with our academy i mean i'm working on building some stuff with my partner here david and uh, you know so i think we might be poised for some for some growth in that area of clubs and indoor facilities and you know great programming uh, and and be diversified not just tennis but many different racket sports and stuff like that under one roof i think I think the day of people flying to a Disney World, I think that's going to be impacted tremendously because there's too many people. Yeah. It's also very expensive. And now that you have you know less income because of business crimping and 
So I think we're going to be seeing a lot more um, things grow in the local markets, and that's where we're going to play. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. There's just a lot of unanswered questions in, in, in the world and definitely in sports today. We just have no idea even which direction to go because we just don't know what's going to happen. So definitely uh, we're going to have to figure out a new model if things stay the way they are. So I have one final topic I want to discuss with you. I know you do a lot of wonderful things with youth today, but you also do a lot of wonderful things around the world. Tell us about the Global Water Foundation. You know that was a uh, that was an interesting thing. I mean, uh, I haven't done much lately with it because obviously, uh, you know, I got busy with my new business. But I, I started my, I started the Global Water Foundation in two thousand five <clears throat> when I was in South Africa. And I met a gentleman uh, in Johannesburg, and he said, "Listen, you know, I'm going to go to Cape Town next week. Do you want to come with me? And I, I want you to come with me as a guest to the World Economic Forum on water." And uh, I flew down and I was absolutely godsmacked. I mean, I, I, I never knew I never knew the extent of the water issues in Africa until I actually sat there and listened to experts. Right. right. And, uh, you know, I lived in, the, at the time I lived in Naples, Florida, which is an extremely wealthy town. And I just thought, you know what, maybe there's a way I can contribute. And so... I started the Global Water Foundation, and it's still a viable foundation today, but we did a number of projects. Uh, we did one in, in, in Uganda. We did a water pipeline with a small tank for a community of 5,000 people with a, in Monta, Ecuador, through some connections. And, uh, you know, we did a bunch of projects just out of the goodness of our hearts and, and people wanting to give money. And, uh, you know, we did a few projects. Uh, we're not a massive NGO. But, uh, you know, I would hope to start that in the next foreseeable future for some other things as well. Amazing. Amazing. Well, I, what I read, you helped at least over 15,000 people get water supplies. So that's a really amazing thing. So I will wrap it up because I know you've got little doggies and little kitties and family to get back to. I'm going to ask you just a few, just some final quick fire questions. You're going to pick one or the other just for a bit of fun. Athlete or coach? Oh man, you had to make me make a decision on that. <laughs> yep. Uh, I I would say you know I'd like to be an athlete. <laughs> okay, Android or iPhone? iPhone. Singles or doubles? Singles. South Africa or Florida? Ooh, that's a tough one. <laughs> Can I skip that one because I'm going to get hate All right. <laughs> All right. No, we'll let you Florida, skip that one. Florida, <laughs> we'll no, give it Florida, a 50 50. Florida, Florida is going to be a bigger economy than uh, the rest of them. So okay. I'm going to stick to Florida. And we'll send our love to South Africa. So it will work <laughs> out. Wonderful. It's been such a pleasure having you on today, learning more about you, family, cutie who's down by your feet. Um, if people want to find out about more about your academy or more about what you're doing, and your projects, how can they reach out to you? Um, many ways. I mean, obviously, we have uh, we have Facebook and stuff like that. And we have my wife is absolutely IT department uh, in my business. So she runs it with me. But uh, they can go to johancreektennis.com <clears throat> and, uh, and uh, you know, just find out about the academy. We're in Jupiter, Florida. We hope to have our new digs in the next 18 months. And uh, look forward to, to having a new place and, uh, you know, just keep on growing and have some fun and make people uh, enjoy the sport of tennis and <clears throat> really enjoy, uh, you know, the outdoors because Florida is a, is a very great uh, state. We have a wonderful uh, governor. We have a, a vibrant business climate here. And uh, we have a lot of South African friends here in, uh, in this part of Florida as well. And it's just a, it's just a wonderful place to live. So, yeah. Um, yeah, they can find out on that and they can also, you know, just Google us and uh, and, and find out about uh, Johan Creek Tennis or, tennis or whatever in, uh, in Florida and it'll pop up. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, like I said, it's been a pleasure to hang out with you and Cutie and we're looking forward to seeing more of your projects and wishing you all the best in the future. Thank you so much for your time, Johan. It was absolutely a pleasure. Anytime, uh, just let me know. Thank you so much, Tasha. Thank you. You have a good night. You too. Bye-bye.
All right, folks, there you have it. Oh my gosh, I just couldn't stop. <laughs> it's almost like an addiction. I just wanted to know more and more and more. Tennis is a sport that I never had the privilege or blessing to play. So it's very exciting to hear about his career, especially during that era. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Don't forget, like seriously, like, follow, share. Go to YouTube, go to Facebook, we're on Instagram. Go to the website, www.globalsportschannel.com. There's more than just the sports personality spotlight and I wanna make sure that you get involved. Now, by the way, I want you to comment on what your favorite moment was or your favorite comment that he made during the show and let us know how you feel. We love to connect. We love to have a conversation with you. So until next time, thank you so much. Tasha D signing off. <laughs>